What a joy it's been all this month to bring you four special Encore presentations of programs from 1997. Your response has been very gratifying, too. This is the last in this series, and it's titled Intimacy, Drawing Near to God. I know the Lord will find a way for me. In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe the Bible is a revelation of His way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. My friend, it's a joy to welcome you to our study of the Bible, In Search of the Lord's Way. We believe the Lord's Way, as it's revealed in the Bible, is the best way to live anyone's ever known. And you know, while there are similarities among all religious groups, there's something distinctive about each one, too. Or there'd be no separateness now, would there? Probably the most distinctive feature of Churches of Christ is our desire and our attempt to teach Christianity as we read about it in the New Testament in our present generation. To put it another way, we're trying to reproduce the church that we read about in the New Testament, its organization, its doctrines, its faith, its mission, its worship, its hope. Well, its entirety. Why not? Well, we make no claim to having done so to perfection any more than the congregations in the New Testament were perfect, or any more than any man can live a perfectly sinless life. But it's a noble and worthy ideal, and we're striving for it. And that accounts for some of our distinctive qualities. For more information, please write us, will you? Well, this is the last in our series on the subject of intimacy with God. It isn't so because we have said all that needs to be said or can be said about it. Oh, no, not that. We promise to say more later. But these four are available in the little book called by that name, and it's free. All you need to do for is just to write us or call us and tell us you'd like to have the book about God. Our address is In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083. Our toll-free telephone number for your use for this very purpose is 1-800-321-8633. So if you'd like one of these messages, let us hear from you this week. God bless you. We Today we're reading that part of the 139th Psalm in which David talks about the omnipresence of God. God is everywhere present. We're beginning in verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell or Sheol, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, thou art there. Even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike unto thee. And then I like the way that he brings to a close this psalm in the 23rd and 24th verses. He says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Now with that in mind, let's go to God in prayer. Dear God and our Father who art in heaven, we are thankful to Thee that You are always present everywhere in our lives. There is no place that we can go when we escape from You. 
And it's a comfort and in, comforting and inspiring thought that we have that you're always near us, present with us to provide us strength when we need it. Father, we pray that as we seek your presence and to draw sacredly into your nearness, that you will bless us in these meditations. In the name of Jesus, amen. In the back of an old hymn book I have from somewhere in the past, it's, it's been a long time because the pages are yellowed and tattered. Someone had written the title of some favorite hymns. At the top of the list is, I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. And then there was another one that said, closer to thee, near to thy side, closer, dear Lord, I would abide. Hold me in thy embrace neath every smile of grace. Grant me thy child a place closer to thee. Those were some of the favorite hymns of a generation that's now moving swiftly into eternity. They had meaning. Millions of souls were drawn into a closer walk with God by singing those beautiful hymns. We've already learned that we, attain, we can't attain this nearness to God of which we sing and for which we pray by elevating ourselves to His level, by our works or our law-keeping on the one hand, nor on the other hand can we achieve it by reducing Him to the level of a God that is invented for our special needs and wants. So how do we achieve it? Well, before ever we begin, it's a must that we be totally and completely honest and open with God. No play acting, no games, no pretense, no charades, just plain openness and sincerity. It's been said that we can deceive some of the people some, uh, all the time and all the people some of the time, but we can never deceive all the people all the time. It's true, too, but we can never fool God, not even for just a moment. He knows us better than we know ourselves. It's as we read in the first part of the 139th Psalm, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou dost know me when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou understand my thought afar off. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down and art intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast enclosed me behind and before and laid Thy hand upon me. That's verses 1 and five to 5 in that 139th Psalm, and that's a great thought. In preparation for our intimacy with God, we must also commit ourselves totally and unreservedly to Him and to His way. God doesn't come to us on our terms. The question of Amos 3.3 3 is relevant here as it is other places. Can two walk together except they be agreed? To walk with Him, we must do it on His terms. Now, some people resist that. They cannot accept a God like that. Well, David helps us again in another passage. This time in Psalm 37, verse 5, he says, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. Our lives must be committed to Him first. 
And if we've not already done so, we must repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. Acts 2.38. Sin <clears throat> separates, alienates people from God. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 to 3. But repentance rids us of the practice of sin. And in baptism, the blood of Jesus Christ washes away all our guilt of sin. And so sin is taken out of the way. From the baptismal waters, a person rises to a new life in Christ, Romans 6, 3 and 4. Born again as a newborn babe, John 3, verses 3 through 5. Oh, but my pastor says I don't have to be baptized. Okay, I'm not here to debate that issue. Each of us must decide, decide for himself who we're going to obey. But there's one thing sure, my friend. No man can walk close to God who quibbles over anything that he says do. And it's a fact that simply can't be ignored that every person who came to Christ, the details of which are recorded in the book of Acts and the epistles, was commanded to be baptized, or he did so. Now that the preliminaries have been taken care of, let's talk about drawing near to God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 2 says, As newborn babes, as newly born Christians, desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. Paul wrote the young man Timothy about the same thing as that. He said, Give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. 1 Timothy 4.13 some versions have it, give attendance to reading the Scriptures. You see, all Scripture is inspired by God, or God breathed, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and training in righteousness. That, and that word that, means it's a statement of purpose. That the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Reading and studying the Scriptures is permitting God to speak to us. It's the only way that He speaks to us nowadays, and it will adequately support us against all the temptations and sin, or the temptation to wander away from His way. In Psalm 119, 11, the man after God's own heart said, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against Thee. Unless it's while a person's um, in serious perusal of God's Word, I suppose it's in private personal prayer that he comes nearer to God than in any other time. Jesus taught us to go to a private place. He called it a closet. And close the door, Matthew 6 and 6, and pray in secret. Go where there's no television or radio or CDs or music or people talking or children playing or telephones or pagers or doorbells where there are no distractions, where we can be absolutely alone with God and open up our hearts in prayer. And he promised, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to, unto their prayers. 1 Peter 3, 12. Let's pray in the morning when we sit down to eat, when we're driving in the car alone, when we're walking along the way, when temptations or dangers or disappointments lurk in the way, and even to close out the day. The Scriptures say, pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. They don't have to be long prayers, but they need to be sincere and frequent and intimate. But some people believe they're more like God and closer to Him when they're doing a good deed, helping someone who is in need in the name of the Savior. Well, we know about the nature of God as He's revealed Himself in the person of Jesus Christ that He went about doing good. And Jesus said, Whosoever shall give a cup of cold water, a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. Mark 9, 41. That isn't trying to get close to God by good works. No, no, it's a matter of being good, not doing good. The persecutor Saul turned Apostle Paul, knew and expressed the joy of being a worker together with God that he wrote about it. 
2 Corinthians 6 and 1. And that's what those great people in Hebrews chapter 11 were. There was Noah and Abraham, Joseph, Moses, and the others. Their names are there because they were workers together with him in his eternal purpose. Never have I personally been more conscious of the presence of the Lord in my life than when I've been working with him in something for his cause that was too much for me to do without him. This ministry, for example, he said, you go and teach, and I'll be with you. And he's present, all right. Oh, yes, he is. Well, in all our private devotions, Bible reading, prayers, hymn singing, and in our service to him, as we've just said, we're drawn into a closer walk and intimacy with God. But there's another great a very strong and effective way that we come nearer to him, and it's in worship. Now, God has seen the appropriateness of specifically designated time for the community of the believers to assemble together. Hebrews 10, 25. He says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And in a specially designed way or form that he is drawn up, we may draw near to him. In every age since the days of Cain and Abel, God has had his own established form of worship, his way by which men may seek intimacy with him, and he's always been very jealous and protective of it. Because God is deeply involved, it's a very sacred and hallowed thing. And for the worshiper to minimize the importance of the details of worship is but to trivialize his God. We learned that from the example of Cain way back in Genesis 4 at the very first mention of worship in all the history, in all the Bible. Cain obviously didn't appreciate the importance of a blood sacrifice to the Lord. God says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, Hebrews 9, 22. And the blood offerings, as far back as Cain, pointed out to the, uh, pointed to the offering of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which would take away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. So what, says Cain? With me, the blood sacrifice is a non-issue. That's modern terminology with reference to the music of worship, the Lord's Supper, Bible reading, preaching in the worshiping assemblies. Well, God had no respect for Cain's worship, and he has no respect for worship today that's offered him in that spirit. In fact, such a worshiper has no respect for his own offering. It's trivial with him a non-issue, without conviction. People are not converted to him today, not because they don't believe what he says, but because he's portrayed by such worship as trivial, a non-issue in critical times. I agree very strongly with Dr. Uh, Donald W. McCullough, president and professor of theology and preaching at San Francisco Theological Seminary, who in discussing these very things says, when the true story gets told, whether in the partial light of historical perspective or in the perfect light of eternity, it may well be revealed that the worst sin of the church in the 20th century has been the trivialization of God. An article in the May issue of Current Thoughts and Trends says, there's an aggressive informality in worship today that manifests itself in the trend to, toward downdressing or dressing down for worship. This the author speaks of as a casual relationship to God, and it deceives us about the fundamental matter of God's nature and character. I don't know the author. I don't know who he is, but I know he's so right. He also adds to that the idea that the carelessness and frivolity typical of so many aspects of contemporary worship puts forth the sentiment that nothing extraordinary is going on in worship. 
that what's happening is a gathering of ordinary people enjoying the experience of community. He says most contemporary forms of worship are, despite their claims of success, based on a fallacy, that the value of worship trends on getting something out of it. The idea that worship should seek to meet people's needs, to meet them where they are, denies the very nature of worship. Worship is meant to be focused Godward, my friend, not manward. When worship becomes a selfish seeking, after our own good, it demonstrates an underlying atheism. But my friend, in true worship, as Jesus said in John 4 and 24, in spirit and in truth, something extraordinary is happening. The worshiper is presenting himself, not in a casual, but in an open and humble and intimate way before the Lord God of heaven and earth. Worship is our offering of sacrifice to the almighty creator and sustainer of this grand universe, the all-loving Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whose sacrifice at Calvary we have access to him. It's sinful man's approach through Christ to the only absolutely sinless and holy one, the sovereign judge of the human race. To me, that's a very unusual and awfully, A-W-E, fully special, a most extraordinary occasion. Shame on us for our casualness toward the worship of the one and only true God. Forgive us, Lord, we pray you, in Jesus' name, despite all feelings about it, no one has ever or ever can achieve intimacy with God who knows no awe in His divine presence in worship. Intimacy is not casualness in the Scriptures. In the Scriptures, true worship of the true God is never called a celebration it's always an awesome occasion. We have no right to expect liberties in prescribing the avenues by which we approach God in worship. God and God alone may do that in true worship. What arrogance and presumption it is on the part of, of a worshiper to assume liberties before the great I am of this universe. That's the lesson to be learned from Nadab and Abihu, the two priestly sons of Aaron who offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Shall we pray? O oh God, we bow before you in submission and reverence in your holy presence. Accept our service in our prayers, in the name of Christ we pray, amen.
What we've been studying as intimacy with God, some have called holiness, without which we're told in the sacred text, no man shall see the Lord, Hebrews 12, 14. And again, give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, Psalm 29, verse 2. Others define it as growth and maturity. The psalmist wrote, It is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord, Psalm 73, verse 28. And God promises, Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty, 2 Corinthians 6, verses 17 and 18. We offer these messages with the prayer that we've helped, been able to help to distinguish between the biblical and the modern concepts of a very precious blessing that we may have with God, having been reconciled to Him in the person of Jesus Christ. I'm fully convinced that the hidden cause of the strife and confusion many churches of different faiths are experiencing today is the lack of awe in God's presence. To put it in stronger terms, the absence of reverence and the fear of God. Or in still another way, the downsizing of God to fit our personal and private needs and whims. It shows in our culture and is even more radically seen in the modernization of worship where men are made the audience instead of God. I pray God has been lifted up and you have been blessed by these messages. They're available now in the little book titled Intimacy with God. For as long as they last, you may have your personal copy, free, of course, simply by requesting it. We're not selling anything here, and I make not one cent off of them personally. Here's the address again. In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083. In Search of the Lord's Way is the name of the ministry. Intimacy with God is the name of the book. Our email address is searchtv at aol.com. Our toll-free telephone number is 1-800-321-8633. Please remember that we're presented here by caring members of Churches of Christ who would sincerely like you to worship with them every opportunity you have right away, if not sooner. And I hope you'll tell them that uh, we invited you. God willing, we'll be back next week at the same time and place, and we'd love to have you with us again. So take care, and may God bless you and keep you. We do love you. Light, shine the